hello again. I got that second video I told you I was going to create for you. That's the um, opposite of our sympathomimetic video that we just created. And that is um, going to break down this time the parasympathetic nervous system for you. We're going to do it in the same format as in talk about system first, talk about neurotransmitters, and talking about receptors. Okay, so when we talk about the system, the first one we're talking about here is, or the system we're talking about is the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, now if you remember the parasympathetic nervous system, it's the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, sympathetic nervous system being, of course, the system that controls our fight or flight response. So it's uh, it's it's very it's very obvious when it's lit up. Uh, if, if if you've ever been super scared or nervous, then then you you recognize when your fight or flight system kicks in. Okay, now uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is different. It is much more finely tuned. It's more of our regulatory. A system that takes care of daily functions such as digestion, um, um, breathing, things like that. So it's 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 a very fine tuned uh, system. It's 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 usually happening all the time, and you just can't tell it because it's not as in, in your face like the sympathetic nervous system is. Okay, so but that's what we're talking about is the parasympathetic nervous system. Now when we talk about neurotransmitters again, we're talking about at the effector site meaning at the end result. So if we're talking as RTs, we're talking about smooth muscles inside of our airways, and we're talking about mucus production inside of our airways, then that's where the end result is, okay? And the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Now I'm just gonna shorten it as ACH. But acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter at the effector site. Now. This, this to me is easier than the sympathetic system because the sympathetic system has two different neurotransmitters. It has acetylcholine at the ganglionic synapse and it has norepi at the effector site, which we've already talked about. But when you're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, it's acetylcholine everywhere. It's acetylcholine at the ganglionic synapse. It's also acetylcholine at the effector site. So it really simplifies it to just remember acetylcholine with the parasympathetic nervous system. Now when we talk about receptors, there's two, di two different receptors, primary receptors that we talk about when we talk about RT pharmacology and the parasympathetic nervous system. And that is muscarinic. And then you also have the nicotinic receptors okay now the parasympathetic nervous system like I said is finely tuned and it's not a problem in most people but when that system becomes irritated or lit up will I say then it leads to the exact opposite of the sympathetic nervous system so I'm gonna put that down here so all of these will lead to a decrease in heart function it will lead to bronchoconstriction and it will lead to an increase in mucus production. Now, this sounds bad, right? It sounds like these are things that we would want to block, correct? And so that brings us to our wording that goes along with now what we've identified as the parasympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine, and our muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. So when we're talking about blocking a system, it's not, we're not mimicking it. If you give a drug that mimics the parasympathetic nervous system, then you will lead to these, these results. You'll lead to a decrease in heart function, bronchoconstriction, and increased mucus. We don't ever want that as RTs. We want an effective heart, we want bronchodilation, and we want decreased mucus. So we want to block these effects. And so the word we use here is lytic. Okay, the, 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 the suffix lytic uh, means to block. Okay, so we're going to take the word para, sympatho, and put lytic on the end of it. 
So we're talking about our parasympatholytic drugs. These are drugs that will block the parasympathetic nervous system and prevent these things from happening, okay? And when we talk about in conjunction with our neurotransmitter acetylcholine, we don't want to give a drug that does the same thing as acetylcholine. We want to give a drug that will work against acetylcholine. So we're going to give an anticholinergic. If you give a cholinergic drug, it will create this response. So we want to give anticholinergic drugs. Okay? And then when we talk about the um, the receptors, I'm just going to focus on muscarinic right here. So we're going to give these drugs, they're going to be called muscarinic. And this is an antagonist. So antagonist means it's going to work against. Okay, if you go back to, to, to early early uh, childhood school where you were learning about literature and you learned that every all the books have an agonist and an antagonist. You thought you're never going to use this information again. Well, it's coming back right now. An agonist is the hero. It does the good work. An antagonist is somebody that the bad guy works against. Okay, So a muscarinic antagonist is a drug that will block the muscarinic receptors. If the muscarinic receptors aren't available, then acetylcholine can't bind to them, and these things can't happen, which is what we want to do, okay? So uh, we give these drugs, and they can be referred to as all of these, parasympatholytics, because we block the parasympathetic nervous system. We give anticholinergics to block the effects of acetylcholine, and these drugs can also be referred to as muscarinic antagonists because they block the muscarinic receptors. Okay, now this is the most common. Of, this is the most common misconception about about these drugs right here. Is you say, okay, so we give these drugs. I'm gonna go over the names of them for you here in just a second. But we give these drugs, and when we give them, they attach to the muscarinic receptors, and they light them up. They light up the muscarinic receptors. Absolutely not. Because that would be a muscarinic agonist, not a muscarinic antagonist. So these drugs look like acetylcholine, but they're not an exact match. And so they can fit in the receptor spot, but they don't initiate a response. All they do is get into the receptor site, the muscarinic receptors. They, go in, they fit into those receptors because they look almost identical to acetylcholine, but they're not. And then they sit there and they block those receptors from the acetylcholine being able to bind to them. And then that ultimately blocks these effects right here, bronchoconstriction, increased mucus production. Okay? So, so you got to understand, first of all, that these drugs don't initiate a response. They block a neurotransmitter from initiating a response. Does that make sense? I kind of like to think of it like a, like a house key. If... If you come over here and you unlock your, your, your door to your house, that's the original key, right? You can get a copy of that key made, and that key will also unlock the door. That would be more like a, a sympathomimetic or an agonist. But what we're talking about is antagonist or anticholinergic. So this is where you take a key that will fit into the key lock, but it won't unlock the door. And you can unlock the door until that key is removed from the key lock. Okay, so you have to think about like maybe that when you think about these drugs and how they how they work in the body. Now, some people break these down into short acting and long acting muscarinic antagonists. I don't I don't really go there with that. Um, you you can you can study it that way if you want to, and I and I'll kind of put them out. But I'm going to talk about the two big ones here that you're seeing. We're talking about functional working. Uh, in the in the current 2018 RT pharmacology, and when you think about parasympatholytics, think about what I like to call as the bromide twins. Okay, if you ever see the word bromide, that's 
then you're talking about a parasympathetic. If you ever look up a drug, like I've never heard of this drug, you look it up and it says something, something bromide, then you know immediately you're talking about an anticholinergic. Okay, so the first one that we're going to talk about here is ipratropium. The brand name for ipratropium is atrovent. This is an aqueous solution or an MDI that is uh, going to be nebulized or given via MDI. Okay, um, it's short acting. It's every four to six hours. It's commonly given in conjunction with albuterol. We call that dual neb. And, and if you're going to classify a SAMA or a LAMA, then you would call this a short-acting muscarinic antagonist because you have to give it throughout the day. You can't just give this one once a day and it work all day long. That's not the way it works. Okay. Now, this other one down here, when we talk about this one, we're talking about teotropium bromide. This brand name is Spiriva. This is available in DPI form. This is a once a day drug. So they will typically do this once in the morning and they don't take it again until the next morning, which would make it a long acting, right? So if you're classifying these Sama and Lamas, then you would classify ipratropin and bromide as your Sama teotropium and bromide as your llama, okay? Now, remember, these drugs block the parasympathetic nervous system. They block acetylcholine. They bind to the muscarinic receptors and block their availability to acetylcholine. This is what makes them parasympatholytics, anticholinergics, muscarinic antagonists, and ultimately, they block the parasympathetic nervous system from bronchoconstriction, and an increase in mucus production. Now, your indications for these drugs, I already hit on one of them, but your primary indication is maintenance for COPD, okay? We think sometimes as ipratropin and bromide is, oh, well, we give it every four to six hours, so it must be a rescue drug. It's only a rescue drug when you're giving it in conjunction with albuterol, and when you do that, you can give it to status asthmaticus when your asthma patients aren't responding to beta agonist therapy alone. Okay, so your, your, your asthmatic comes into the ER, you're giving them albuterol, albuterol, albuterol. It's not helping. Now your indication is to add ipratropium bromide in to be given in conjunction to help with the bronchoconstriction. Okay. Your other indication and your primary indication you'll see these drugs in use is for maintenance therapy in your COPD patients. Primarily because they live with an increase in bronchomotor tone, which is a parasympathetic response. Their airways have a tendency to be constricted at a greater level all the time. That's a, that's a parasympathetic response. If we can block that, then we can dilate and relax their airways better. Okay, now your other... Um, thing that you may hear when you're talking about parasympathetic nervous system is somebody who's uh has allergies um or seasonal allergies or, or allergic asthma and and they shut down in the presence of an antigen which would be maybe due to a vaguely mediated response so the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system it operates with acetylcholine at the effector site binding to muscarinic receptors and when something comes in and irritates the vagus nerve bronchoconstriction happens so they refer to this as vaguely mediated bronchoconstriction okay if that's the case then these drugs given it a maintenance perspective can block those muscarinic receptors and prevent that bronchoconstriction from ever happening in the first place Parasympathetics. Hope this helps, guys. Let me know. Leave your comments below. Have a great day.